listen only mode. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matt Parker. I'm with Marshall Parker and Weber, and we're here today to discuss some changes in the notary law that will affect uh, how some of you may do your practice, uh, particularly if you're in the estate planning field like we are. Uh, these changes, of course, are going to affect all the notaries out there. So no matter your area of practice, whether you're in banking, or financial planning, and you happen to be uh, doing some notarization in your office, uh, this will be a great review for everyone. I am co-presenting today with our firm's chief notary, Jody Lose. Um, she and I joined the firm at the same time, about 17 years ago. Yes. Uh, uh, seems like yesterday. Um, we've seen a lot of changes in our various laws over the years, uh, Medicaid laws, uh, state planning uh, rules and regulations, but this is the first big change in the notary practice uh, in 14 years, and, and the biggest, as we've been told, uh, since uh, the notary statute was initially enacted. Uh, so do ask your questions as we go along. Uh, before uh, we begin, uh, I want to give some credit to Mark Aronson, who's the uh, president of the Pennsylvania Association of Notaries. Uh, he and I presented uh, this material and, and much more during a PBI presentation uh, not too long ago. Um, he's actually the primary proponent of a lot of the changes we're going to talk about, so a lot of credit goes to him, uh, to the content of the changes in the law. Um, so we're going to present basically some highlights of the changes. We're not going to go through all of them, uh, but the highlights as they are affecting our estate planning work. Uh, so for those of you who may be involved in, in a similar practice, a lot of these highlights are going to be relevant to you. Um, and do contact the Pennsylvania Association of Notaries. They have a great website. And, and Jody, you're often in contact with them if you have any questions uh, about the changes in the law. They're an excellent resource for you. Okay. Here are our pictures, Jody, just like they were 17 years ago. <laughs> Mine was updated, unfortunately. Yeah, yes, okay. Uh, so, so what is this law? Um, well, Pennsylvania has joined a number of states in enacting what is called a uniform law on notarization. Uh, these are the laws that are consistent from state to state. Uh, it's, the law has been updated to also address some changes in our society. Uh, it addresses both the traditional paper notarizations that you're familiar with and also the growing interest in electronic notarization. Uh, now, although this law was passed four years ago, it just took effect last month on October 26th of 2017. And uh, there are regulations that are going to follow probably in the spring of 2018. So a lot of the details of the various sections that we're going to talk about today are probably going to be refined uh, through some regulations that you'll see in the future. Uh, do watch for those regulations. They'll probably appear on the Department of State's website or the Pennsylvania Association of Notaries website. So why do we have a new law? Well, a lot has changed since the original notary provisions. Uh, for example, we've got a wave of identity theft cases out there. There's a lot of fraud being committed. Um, and notaries are being utilized in the commission of uh, fraudulent acts. Uh, there's lots of immigration uh, that's happened in our country, and that's created a challenge for the purpose of identifying a lot of those individuals who come before a notary. Uh, so for those reasons and others, we now have some stricter rules, uh, some increased education requirements, and some penalties for notaries. Uh, Jody, anything else that you recall from talking to Pan? Those seem to be the hot reasons why we have a new statute. I think that those are the hot topics, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what has not changed? Uh, a lot of what you're going to do as a notary will stay the same, uh, from the personal appearance uh, of the client before you to the use of uh, the rubber stamp that we've always had. Uh, it's just that the provisions have been updated in many cases. Uh, there have been changed provisions, for example, with the journal. Uh, the content of what's going into the stamp has changed, and so on. So here's a brief overview of what's new in RULANA. That's the uh, abbreviation uh, for the Revised Uniform Law on Not Notarial Acts. Uh, the RULANA law has these, these areas of change, significant areas of change that are affecting our practice. Uh, and we're going to focus on them because they come up in a, a legal office and they involve the training that goes into our notaries, 
gosh, Judy, we have quite a few of them on staff, about half a dozen. Yes. Okay. So uh, the training is important for all the notaries if you have them on staff. Um, the educational requirements, the identification requirements, and that's particularly important as an attorney, um, as I'm having these documents notarized, what does my notary need uh, for identification purposes? And also the record keeping as it relates to the journal has also been updated. I wanted to, to mention this section of the law, uh, and it may actually get some refining as the regulations come out, uh, but this is important for those out there who might work for general practice law firms, uh, and you may be representing some small businesses. Um, there is a prohibition on notarial acts that are performed by the notary or the notary spouse in transactions where either one of them have what is called a pecuniary interest. Uh, this would be a financial interest. So what you're probably going to see is a small business. Uh, maybe that business is selling cars or maybe that's a small real estate business. It's a mom and pop shop, if you will. And one of the spouses has a notary uh, and they've been no notarizing documents associated with this business. Well, this section, if you read Section 304, uh, restricts the ability of spouses to perform these acts in small companies where one of the spouses has uh, a financial interest. Uh, so my thought is a lot of these small businesses that are represented by law firms on there, out there might be calling the lawyers and saying, listen, what am I supposed to do here, uh, you know, in terms of no notarizing these documents in light of this new section? Uh, can we get around it? Um, do I need an employee to engage in the notary? How do we deal with this? And so my suspicion is there are lots of lawyers out there, uh, particularly uh, with, with broader practices than we have. We do estate planning and elder law. Uh, we don't get into the, the details of the operations of businesses, uh, but I suspect this issue is being asked quite a bit um, as to how uh, they can deal with uh, the notarization prohibition, uh, given the fact that one spouse may have a financial interest in the company. If you read on, it doesn't apply, obviously, to uh, publicly traded companies uh, and your employees or officers can still engage in notarization. So um, it's just if you have an ownership interest in the company. Anything else on that, Jody? I don't believe so. Okay, no, you've pretty good. covered it. Yeah, good. All right. So this is uh, the first area that, that struck me, and, and I was hoping this would have changed, quite frankly, but I can understand why is it, it hasn't changed. Uh, so, Jody, you want to talk a little bit about personal appearance, which apparently still required in notarizations. Matt, this is correct. Uh, the, the person that is appearing before the notary to sign documentation and have it notarized must appear before the notary themselves. Right. And we do a lot of audio video work. You know, we have multiple offices and, and you know, I'm here in Williamsport, but I often have cases in Wilkes-Barre. And, and Jody might be here as the case manager taking some notes while I'm on the television in Wilkes-Barre. Uh, and that's okay just for the purpose of conducting the initial consultation. But once we have documents that have to be notarized, then uh, you actually have to travel to Wilkes-Barre if you are the notary. That's and, right. That's right. Or we have all our staff out there do the notarization. Uh, so they're not honoring the audio video uh, you know, concept in terms of notarization yet. We haven't gotten that far. Uh, there's a lot of material out there about electronic notarization, so they have addressed that in the changes in the law. We don't do any electronic notarization, and, and from what I've learned from Mark at the Pennsylvania Association of Notaries, it, it, there's a handful of people out there doing it, um, so we're not going to cover it at this point. It hasn't affected our practice yet, uh, but they did go so far as to address uh, the change in technology, uh, address the change in technology when it comes to electronic notarization but personal appearance is still required. All right, the identification section, I think you and I talked about this, Jody, and we probably should spend some time on this section, is probably the biggest change in the law um, from my standpoint as an attorney. Uh, the basis upon which the notary uh, has been able to verify the individual's um, identity uh, who appear, appears before the notary has, has changed uh, to a degree. Uh, personal knowledge was often used by the law firms who have employed notaries over the years. 
Uh, the idea was that the law firm, um, including the notaries, would have typically a long-standing relationship with its clients and essentially allow you, Jody, the notary, to use the law firm's relationship to form the basis of your personal knowledge. So in other words, you were basically piggybacking on maybe the fact that a senior attorney had a long-standing relationship with this client who came into the office for all scores of legal work over the years. Right. So um, what the, essentially the expanded definition uh, is saying uh, is that uh, there, this section called personal knowledge, we just referred to it as personal knowledge, is going to be limited um, in use by the notary. The notary now has to have some sort of personal dealings with the client outside of the law firm. So it's not enough that uh, the lawyer may actually have some personal knowledge of this person. You would have to have some personal knowledge. Uh, is that fair to say? That's right. Yeah. So what has been told to me um, is that, listen, you may know the guy down the street from you, Jody. You pass him on the way to work every day and he mows his lawns. He seems like a nice guy. And maybe you bump into him at the grocery store. But even at that point, you don't really have the personal knowledge, do you? No. No. You'd actually have to have some, some you know, friendly relationship with him. He comes over and talks to you and you develop a relationship with him over time in order to use, use this section uh, that we're calling personal knowledge. That's right. Yeah. And the idea was if you had to get on the stand and you were challenged, uh, you know, in some proceeding, let's say call it a will contest, uh, they, they, they might ask you, how do you have this personal knowledge? And you want to be in a position to identify the, the factors that led to you using this section of the law. Right. That's correct. OK. So if you can't use that section, good gosh, we used it for <laughs> I don't know how long. And I'm sure lots of other law firms have been using it. What then? Uh, can you use if you're in a law firm and somebody comes in and wants some documents drafted by the estate planner and you have to notarize them? Well, it's this next section under the identification uh, statutory provision. It is the satisfactory evidence. So here's where most notaries are going to fall. And I think by talking to uh, Mark at the Pennsylvania Association of Notaries, this is where they want to push everybody. They want you to get some form of ID. Um, in it, even in a law firm where you're having wills signed and trusts and powers of attorney and deeds, and these clients have been, may have been known to you for years, they want you to get ID from these people. And they want the notary to have that ID in their journal. So you can see there are some different forms of identification that are now permitted. And do you want to touch on those, Jody, the, the different types of ID that they have here? Um, well, the, the personal knowledge is the one. We've already touched on that a little bit. Um, the notary must have the personal knowledge of the person they are notarizing for if they are using this ID type. Um, the PAN guide expands on the Rolona law to help give guidance to notarize. It states if the notary is performing acts for relatives, friends, or neighbors that they may choose not to ask for photo ID. However, if they are not known to the notary and the notary has not shared experiences like Matt has talked about with them over a period of time and in a variety of situations involving others, personal knowledge should not be used. Right. So we've kind of clarified that. So they, then that falls into the satisfactory evidence. And we've got, looks like one, two, three options here. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the photo ID is one. You touched on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, that must be a passport, driver's license, or other government non-driver ID, which is current and unexpired. So, so that's important mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that that's reviewed. Another form of government ID can also be used, which is current, contains the signature or photo, so it doesn't have to be both, mm -hmm. Uh, of the individual and is satisfactory to the notary. So again, the notary has the option of reviewing that information and making sure that it, it uh, they're comfortable with using that type of ID. Yeah, and the whole, part of the whole pr part of this statute is to root out the fraud. And so uh, they're putting in greater emphasis on getting the ID of the individual uh, when you're notarizing these documents. And it'd be great if everybody just had a photo ID, a driver's license that was unexpired, you know, that would probably do. Um, the problem is you're going to run into people who don't have these uh, forms of documentation. Uh, here in our office, we do a lot of elder law work. We go into nursing homes and meet 
elderly individuals who are competent and capable of signing an updated document, and they just gave up driving years ago, and they don't have another form of ID. Now, they may actually have a Medicare card or a Social Security card, which we may want to rely upon uh, to meet this identification requirement, but they don't have that. Uh, certainly, they aren't able to show it to us, and that becomes an issue a lot of times. They, they just don't have the, the cards with them. Uh, then we have to rely on some other area of this law, and I believe uh, most attorneys are going to basically making uh, an affirmation um, to the notary saying, listen, you can rely on my representation to you that this person is who he or she claims to be. Uh, most attorneys are gathering information about these people when they're developing their file. They've got all sorts of information about where they live, dates of birth, social security numbers, other confirming uh, parts of this person's identification. You know, if we're not operating in a vacuum here. It's a law firm or some other financial institution. If you're a financial planner, an accountant, a uh, banking business, you're, you're probably developing a file on these people. And so I think it would be acceptable for you to turn to the notary and say, yes, you can rely on my representation that this person is who they claim to be. So that's sort of the fallback if you look under 307B by verification on oath or affirmation of a credible witness. And so the attorney, the banking officer, the trust officer, um, the financial plan, whoever it is in the office is going to have to turn to the notary and say, you can rely on what I'm telling you. That's right, Matt. And, and this is actually, if you've read the Rolona Law, um, mm -hmm. they actually changed the wording. An oath and affirmation is basically an affidavit. Um, so it is going to be something that's in writing that the notary will have to have the other staff member sign saying that they're going to use this credible witness mm -hmm. identification. And then the notary also has to notarize that document and that will be something additional that will be logged into their journal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you want to have that sort of documentation there in case everybody kind of, anybody comes forward and says, hey, how did you know this person? That's right. And now it's easier within the offices I'm talking about because these are professional offices or people providing services. I'm not quite sure how notaries who essentially have their shingle hung up somewhere out there in the community are going to get these affirmations. Are they going to have a form ready to be signed and who are they going to turn to? Are they going to allow a fellow family member to provide it? That seems to be a slippery slope. Uh, you really want somebody independent of the transaction to give you this oath or affirmation. And the thing of it is that that's important to point out, these credible witnesses, the credible witness has to be personally known by the notary mm -hmm. and then the credible witness has to personally know the person that's going to have their signature notarized. So no ID can be used in this credible witness affidavit yeah. uh, part that will be used. Yeah. So that's a tough one. I mean, we, we, we talk about elderly individuals. I think I'm really comfortable with the elderly people because, listen, there's no reason why I'm going to a nursing home to have wills or powers of attorney signed uh, and this person would not, you know, claim uh, to be somebody who they are not. Right. It's not the, the context just doesn't give rise to fraud. Um, but there are cases where you're going to have to be very careful about getting that oath or affirmation. Here's another area of change. Uh, it's familiar to us estate planners. A notary is now asked to make sure the transaction meets the capacity test, is not subject to undue influence, and there's no fraud involved as it relates to the signature. If the notary feels uncomfortable, he or she can refuse to notarize the document. Uh, of course, in the estate planning field, we've seen a lot of people prey on the elderly uh, who have diminished capacity. They will ask them to, to notarize, or they ask notaries um, to notarize documents like wills or deeds that benefit this person. Uh, then a lovely 11th hour change in the will that leaves everything to one child, for example. Uh, as an attorney, I'm obligated to uh, protect my client uh, who has diminished capacity and refuse to execute these documents. And so, we try to recognize undue influence cases and avoid helping these unscrupulous family members. Uh, I'm glad notaries are being asked to look for the same inappropriate conduct. Um, financial abuse of the elderly is, elderly is a big, big problem in our country. So hopefully not only the attorneys, but the notaries and other professionals, bank officers, financial advisors, and others are looking for this sort of abuse. 
And Jody, this is where we get into a lot of your uh, procedural issues. And here's one about this, the changes in the stamp. What has gone on here? Well, there's some minor changes with the border mm -hmm. and placement. Anybody familiar with what their notary stamp looks like? They know that, you know, generally it's got a little black border around it. So they've moved some things around on it. Um, the, the, the border is still a requirement on the stamp. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that, that used to be on the outside of the border is now on the inside. Um, the first line with the notary seal uh, uh, listed just after it. The notary's name and the title is the same. It's listed as line two. The third line is now just the county of the commission. They have removed the municipality requirement. Um, the fourth line still lists the date of the commission expires. Um, and the fifth line has been added for the commission number. This is the number that is listed on the notary certificate when you get it and remains the same number throughout your commission renewals. Um, one thing to point out, if you are in the middle of your current commission, you do not have to run out and have your stamp changed. Um, it is being grandfathered in. Uh, but you will need to have it changed when you renew it to conform to the current laws. Um, I would also like to mention too, if you still use the metal notary seal, um, you can continue to use that. These were taken out of the required tools back in 2003, but a lot of notaries and our office even still use them as ways to tell an original from a copy of a document. Um, you're still allowed to use them under the new Relona law. So the stamp makers are going to make a few dollars over the next few years. Yeah, it sounds like it. brand new stamps for everybody. <laughs> All right. Maybe maybe they had some lobbyists in Harrisburg. Okay. So this is kind of a tricky area. This is the changes to the journal. Uh, you know, every notary has a journal in some form in the office. Probably varies from case to case as to how you keep it. Uh, we have, a, you know, I don't know if you want to mention it. We have an experience. <laughs> We have an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, it's easy to modify, and I bet you I, we're not the only ones who do do that. Um, but nevertheless, they're just starting to crack down on these notary journals. Tell me what they want now, Jody. Well, the, the entries still need to be in chronological order. Um, the date of the Notary Act um, that it was done is still required. They did add the addition of the time of the act. Um, so the actual time that the that the notary starts doing their notarizations of those documents has to be logged. Um, the type of the act is still required. This is where, where you would choose whether it's an acknowledgement, a verification, uh, witnessing certification, that type of thing. Um, the type of document has been added, so you would identify your document, whether it's a will, a POA, a beneficiary change form. Um, notary fees or administrative fees must be listed whether you charge for it or not. And if you don't charge, you have to put, you know, not applicable in that field. It's got to have something listed there. You still list the person who is presenting before you to be notarized, but now you also need to list the city and the state where they reside as well. Um, the ID method is still required. You still need to list your ID details, which this would be your type of ID, whether it's a driver's license, um, or another type of government ID. You need to list that issue and expiration date uh, or the name of your credible witness. If you're using that affidavit, you need to list their name in there, who you're using. Then of course you have your additional comment section. And I use that as a carryover field. You know, any information that I can't put in those other fields, I list in there if there's something that happened during the signing that I want to document. And I mentioned the Excel spreadsheet, not to disappoint anybody out there who's uh, already doing that um, like we were. Uh, they want a tamper-resistant uh, format. Um, they want something that cannot be changed. So they either want a bound book going forward. Talk about going old school. They, they want some sort of uh, documentation that cannot be altered. Of course, the Excel spreadsheet could be altered. And so, uh, And you got an email from them basically confirming that. Yes. Yeah. So we have to address that going forward. Uh, how can we create a journal that can't be altered that's still flexible enough for us to enter our, our data? Um, and so that's a challenge for all of us, I think, as how we're going to craft these journals under their new requirements. 
All right, examination and education. We have two slides on this, Jody. Why don't you take us into the new rules? Well, the prior ruling that grandfathered in all notaries and commissions in effect uh, on July 1st of 2003 is abolished. That ruling stated that if you already were commissioned, that you were exempt from ever being required to take classes forever, so long as your commission never lapsed. Under the new Rolona ruling, that is abolished. Um, this makes sense as things change and notaries should be up to date with training. Now all notaries are required to take the approved education course with each reappointment or a new appointment. Also now, any new notary commission also must pass another exam administered by the Department of State's vendor. This is a Pearson view. Now our office has not had any notaries that have had to take this additional exam yet. My understanding is the Department of State will review and approve the notary application then the notary will receive an email with this exam info. Uh, you'll log in to the exam website and take this online test. There is an additional fee for it. It's $65. The applicants will have six months, though, to take the test and pass. It can be retaken as many times as needed within that six-month window. Once the applicant passes the test, the pass info uh, information is provided to the Department of State and they will send out your letter of instruction for your effective date to finish the process. Now, this could be a little different. I'm, I'm going by what is listed in the, in the regs on this, have not gone through it ourselves, so we don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, again, people who give exams are going to make some money. On yes. This. Okay, there you go. Yes, uh, you it's know. an additional fee. It's going to take longer That's to right. get, you know, commissioned and get in place. So people are going to make money. That's right. Um, so, okay. And you covered both of these slides. Okay. So we've got one more section to address then, right? We've got to deal with the so. sanctions. Um, so what they're trying to do is crack down on the bad notaries, uh, notaries who are doing their job improperly. Uh, obviously, those of us in law firms have been doing this properly for many, many years. Um, yes. So these are the other notaries somewhere else um, that, of course, are not doing their job. And uh, they want to crack down on the use of the notary in an inappropriate fashion. And they've increased the sanctions. I think it used to be what, Jody, $500? I believe so, 500. Yes. So they doubled it now. Uh, there's going to be a $1,000 penalty for any act or admission uh, on any person who performs a notarial act. And I'd like to point out it's yeah. each act. Yeah. So, so, you know, does that mean that that's each line entry in your journal? If you make a mistake, it's yeah. it's really. You do four documents for somebody, four deeds, let's say, $4,000. How much do notaries one. make in a given year? I mean, that's... It, <laughs> and it's just, I, I think you're going to put them out of business, and, exactly. and I think that's the idea here is we catch you doing this, we are going to take away your ability to notarize, and we will levy such a large sanction against you. You will never be able to pay it off, and you will go out of business. I'm just reading between the lines here, yeah. but I'm thinking that $1,000 per violation. Now, you do right. have yeah. the, the bonding. Uh, notaries are required to have bond, mm -hmm. so you do have that, and I believe that uh, takes place first. And then you have the option of getting errors and emissions insurance, which, you know, you, you want to avoid having a sanction to begin with. But, you know, they do have some requirements in there to help cover if, if there is something that is wrong and you do get penalized for it. Yeah, I'm just going to go out on a limb and saying maybe the insurance company won't want to pay for your $1,000 or $2,000 fine. It might not actually be covered. So I, I will hope that we will never go down this path. You will keep all the notaries in, in the, on the straight and narrow. Yes. Okay. So hopefully you will too with your various companies and, and law firms. Uh, I don't believe there are any questions today. And so we're going to sign off and hope you come back to us in the near future. If you have any future questions about notarization, I encourage you to visit the Department of State's website, dos.pa.gov, or the Notaries website for the Pennsylvania Association of Notaries at notary.org and our website, PAElderLaw.com. Thank you. Thank you.